Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to today's SIG webinar. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for the next hour. My name is Snehal Sinvad. Some of you know me here at SIG, and I manage member services. And I have the pleasure of facilitating today's webinar entitled, One Size Does Not Fit All, New Strategies in Engaging and Managing Talent for Mid-Market Organizations, presented by DCR. Today's webinar is meant to be interactive, so please submit your questions throughout the presentation by typing them into the Q&A box. We will do our best to answer all questions at the conclusion of the presentation. We will also be sharing the slides and we will push them out at the conclusion of the webinar. Okay, but before I proceed, I have a couple of housekeeping and calendar items I'd like to review with you guys. So as you can see here, uh, here's a list of all the services that we provide at SIG. Uh, you'll notice that, you know, we have global events uh, in North America, in Europe, and Asia. We also have our weekly webinar series, just like the one that you're on today, and we also have our peer-to-peer -peer resources. You also have access as a member to our SIG Resource Center, where you have access to over 5,000 presentations, research, white papers, tools, templates, and more. Everybody has access to the career network. If you're a SIG member, you can post jobs, and if you're a SIG member, you can also find jobs or internships. We also have our student talent outreach program, so you guys can meet students that are interested in a career in supply chain. And if you have any other questions, you can always feel free to reach out to any SIG member. The SIG Global Executive Summit is an opportunity for you to network uh, with over 300 sourcing professionals. We will be in Carlsbad, California, October 9th through the 12th. And registration is open, and you can see our agenda online, okay? Just go to sig.org slash summit. So SIG is also bringing events to you over the globe. As you can see here on the list, August 31st, uh, depending on which uh, side of the world you're on, we'll be in Boston, and we're also going to be in Sydney, Australia. And then as part of our CPO Meet and Eat series, in September 12th, we'll be in Seattle. On September 13th, we will be in New York and San Francisco. And then on October 26th, after the summit, we will be in Toronto. I also want to give a uh, talk about uh, SIG University. So SIG University is an opportunity for sourcing professionals to, to gain some training and development. Uh, enrollment is open. The next uh, set of classes begin on June 26th. So if you're interested in joining SIG University, please go to siguniversity.org. And finally, the individual member program. So you can still maintain some of the membership benefits as a SIG member, as an individual. You'll have access to the SIG Resource Center, peer-to-peer -peer network, webinars, and, and much more. So if you guys are interested in that, you can always go to our site and visit the uh, membership programs. Okay, so again today, uh, I'm really happy to have DCR here as a part of SIG to present to you this presentation on One Size Does Not Fit All, New Strategies in Engaging and Managing Talent for Mid-Market Organizations. Today's presentation is actually going to be a panel discussion, and our moderator for today's discussion is Mr. Jay Lash. Um, Jay is uh, a very experienced um, workforce solutions Professional, he has extensive experience and documented achievements in workforce solutions and currently provides advisory services to companies looking to transform the way the work gets done. His expertise includes launching new products, building innovative workforce solutions, and executing new strategies. And Jay is also the leader of SIG's Workforce Solutions Workforce uh, Working Council, and he's also SIG ambassador. Um, he's also a principal consultant of Compass Rose Advisory, so he's definitely an authority in the subject matter, and we're really happy to bring Jay aboard. Jay? Well, thank you very much, guys, and I really appreciate that intro, Sne, as uh, complete as it is. Um, so welcome, everybody in the audience, for joining us in this presentation, and thank you, DCR, for, for hosting. Uh, let me start off by doing some quick introductions to our panelists. We've got some uh, great, highly experienced, nearly 100 years of experience in this uh, in this group. So, uh, hopefully, any question or concern, issue or uh, insight you're looking for, you should be able to emerge from this group. So, let's start off with uh, Richard Snyder, who is the VP of Channel Partnerships at uh, DCR Workforce. And Richard, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and why you're here? 
Jay, thanks for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here with the SIG uh, group and, and also with the attendees. Uh, I'm Richard Snyder. I'm the Vice President of Channel Partnerships for DCR, and I work with companies who, uh, MSP providers and, and companies uh, alike who are looking for workforce solutions. Uh, I've been in the business for 20 years, Jay, and you and I met many years ago. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an operations person at heart, but uh, uh, look for uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, opportunities within not just the MSP and the VMS and the staffing and then, and then just the operations within within whatever solutions there are. So thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to the discussion. You bet. All right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we also have uh, an esteemed uh, MSP uh, workforce solutions expert, Joanne Estrada. Uh, Joanne is from Ronstadt. Joanne, why don't you tell us a little about yourself? Certainly. Thanks, Jay. Good afternoon. My name is Joanna Estrada. I am Global Head of Contingent Workforce Solutions for Ronstadt Source Freight. So what that means is I have global responsibility to define and strategize on not only our contingent solutions, but also our integrated solutions as we see the industry looking towards um, more of an integrated model. I do have over 21 years of experience uh, where the first three pretty much started out as IT staffing, and then I quickly moved over to the MSP solutions um, for, the past, for the past 18 years. In, in global areas that included uh, EMEA, APAC, and of course Latin America. This did include implementations as well as operational oversight from an MSP perspective, not only on the MSP side from a, from a supply perspective, but also on the buy side. Spent about five years of those 18 years in procurement for, for an organization um, buying labor. I'm very happy to be here and excited for the topic at hand. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Joanne. And obviously, nice to have both perspectives represented here as buyer as well as a provider. Uh, also joining us today, uh, again, with multiple years of experience, of which I was a pleasure to have known Jesse during some of those years. Uh, Jesse Gunther from Allegis Group, or Global Solutions, excuse me. Jesse, tell us a little about yourself. Thanks, Jay, um, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as the slide indicates, I've spent 20 years, much like um, Richard and Joanne, um, in this industry. I started my career on the staffing side of our business, seven years there, um, and moved into the MSP side um, very early on with Allegis Global Solutions, and um, had the pleasure of getting involved in some of the great global work um, that we um, we're introducing ourselves to um, in the mid 2000s, and um, and then moved over to London, and um, ran our MSP business across EMEA and Asia for um, close to five years. And um, I'm now um, in charge of the um, newest product for Allegis Global Solutions, um, Sigma, which is targeted toward this small and mid um, mid market space. So a very relevant topic for us today. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you all panelists for, for joining us and let's, uh, let's get started. For those in the audience, if you have any questions that come up during the way, I'll be monitoring that Q&A and if it's relevant to our conversation at the time, I'll bring it up. If not, I'll save a question for later on in the, uh, in the broadcast. So, uh, let's get started. Let's, let's talk about the topic. Uh, you know, clearly what we have seen uh, in the most recent years is a strong growth in the use of non-employee talent. These are temporary workers from staffing agencies. These are freelancers as well as independent consultants. And now we're even including your uh, project workers that work assigned on a SOW or statement of work. Uh, initially, the solutions for this group of talent was really relegated more towards a large enterprise organization, and for a number of good reasons. Number one, and clearly the, the most obvious, was their needs were the most paramount. They were talking major companies, uh, were, were talking about 1,000 to maybe 10,000 employees that were non-employee workers and needed some way to centralize that solution. And of course, the VMS solutions that were available really targeted those large enterprise or organizations. Big market companies, though, are still utilizing uh, contingent workers, and I think what we've seen is a tremendous growth in that mid market because they're more dependent now on this being an integral part of their overall workforce, and maybe even to the point where they're favoring the use of non-employees to give them a little bit more of a nimble competitive edge uh, in the markets that they serve 
Uh, very popular, we're finding in certain industries that you might say 50% of their workforce is considered non-employee. Now the real challenge had been that scaling a solution to support a small or medium-sized business uh, was very difficult because there was requirements in the technology for large integrations. Uh, there was a lot of uh, data uh, analysis and data loading and, and collection, and a lot of that was just not available to the size and scope of those smaller organizations. But number one, with their increased use, and number two, with the very uh, extreme advantages that are now emerging through technology, it's really becoming a much more popular option for these small and medium-sized businesses to seek some sort of a third-party technology solution and integrated uh, third-party provider uh, to help uh, so we're going to try to get out there today and, and, and look for the lessons that were learned in the large market, uh, the enterprise market, and see how it applies to this new market. Um, so before we get started and start asking questions of our panelists, let me let me start by a, a brief definition. I think we all pretty much agree on the size uh, uh, scope that we're talking about here. The definition that we use for the bin market are really small to medium-sized businesses under a billion dollars in size. Uh, their spend levels generally between five and maybe up to 20, 25, maybe 30,000, or excuse me, million dollars in contingent or non-employee labor. Um, generally, they use uh, about, a, let's say, under 1,000 employees, regular employees. That number shifts tremendously. I talked to a company today that had, um, you know, that, that had 100,000 workers of which only 10,000 uh, were represented in the traditional contingent workforce and less than 500 in their regular workforce. So here's uh, an example of a mid-market company that had uh, a tremendous need for, for some kind of uh, assistance in managing this large and diverse workforce. So let's, uh, let's bring this to the first question and maybe the panelists uh, uh, could start thinking about this and as well the audience, uh, how this applies. Do mid-market companies have the same co-employment compliance and other workforce risks as a larger organization? Is that maybe one of the reasons this may be challenging? Let's start with Richard. What do you, what do you think to that question, Richard? Jay, thanks. You, you know, they, I, and from my perspective, the, the small to mid-sized companies have exactly the same challenges hmm. that the largers have. Uh, primarily, you know, you're looking at uh, co-employment, co compliance, uh, what's really climbing the ladder now from a priority standpoint is is just the available talent. You've got to cast mm. out a wide net. Uh, again, you're 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 growing your your flexible workforce, and, or maybe it's uh, being done ad hoc. But the, the need uh, the need is there. Uh, plus, you've got some you know some drive for getting more for for your money. So you want efficient processes, you want uh, effective workflows to help you get to to the end product. You want to get the people there on time uh, and managing your, your networks and uh, of, of talent providers, uh, you know, and, and getting the value out of that workforce that you can while also controlling, you know, who's in your building, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then there's some unique problems, uh, I think, that, that come along with that in that, you know, scale. You know, uh, our large global clients use SmartTrack, which is uh, our VMS, one of our one of our solutions, and you know they've got full advantage of a lot of different different things. But you know, when when it comes down to the the smaller spend, uh, they might not have the the scale. And you know, we've we've got our our scaled product, which is called SmartTrack now, but that affords people the 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 ability to get tap into some resources. So, you know, you're looking at uh, all of this tied to spend, lowering those thresholds gives you, gives you the ability to actually utilize technology to manage the, the, the workforce. However, you might not have the bandwidth, and that's the unique uh, challenge, I think, that uh, the smaller uh, companies have, or the companies with lower contingent spend, is the available resources, and that's where companies uh, like uh, who are represented on the call today, have a lot of expertise now to, and have developed really good work practices and best practices uh, that these companies can take advantage of. And if they don't have experts in-house, they certainly can get them within the solution. That's, so that's kind of my thought. 
so in general, you're, you're saying that in the large enterprise, people from procurement perhaps or HR could take responsibility for this workforce and, and add um, some dimension to the support systems necessary uh, to really uh, manage and centralize this. But small and medium-sized companies don't really have resources they could dedicate to it. So uh, that's been a challenge, and uh, perhaps the, the, the most recent and current technologies uh, can alleviate that with more uh, self-service. Yeah, it, it, it sometimes it's the same person that's in the organization, uh, whereas there's full departments within the larger uh, companies, Jay. So I think that that's a particular challenge, just getting the expertise and the bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's throw a, another question out there to the audience, uh, to the panelists. So do the vendors, suppliers buy into this concept of, let's say, a third party or a managed service um, providing uh, this, this sort of support? Because traditionally, as we well know, the staffing companies that dealt with uh, the smaller organizations had very direct relationships uh, with their clients. And uh, does this mean that with this sort of centralized solution, similar to the way the enterprise runs it, that there are, there's going to be a... Uh, sort of a gap in that, and, and do the suppliers buy into that? Let me uh, ask one of our uh, MSP experts, Jesse. What what are your thoughts on on how suppliers respond to this? Thanks, Jay. Um, you know, the short answer is yes. They they absolutely are buying into um, the concept of of MSP even in the mid market. Um, the longer answer doesn't necessarily veer from the challenges that we see across all markets, from small to enterprise and global. Um, MSP as a solution is, is evolving at a, a faster pace of change than we've seen in a long time. However, MSP programs of all shapes and sizes continue to be predominantly supplier funded. Um, we are seeing a shift in this funding model specifically in the services procurement space, but not for the traditional contract workforce at this point. So because it's a, a standard approach, um, there are few suppliers in the marketplace who aren't familiar with the cost of doing business and therefore adoption is high, um, even in the, the small to mid-market, though certainly there are um, challenges with some of the um, really small niche players um, mm -hmm. in, in some of the smaller pockets. Um, but once we're um, able to get in front of them and talk about um, the overall MSP market as a whole, um, we've had very little challenge so far um, with supplier adoption. So generally, uh, a large let's say national organization or even regional player has gotten used to the idea of working through some kind of a third party or some sort of solutions vendor uh, and, and, and is comfortable with the idea that there's value to be provided uh, through the additional cost they might have to, uh, to fund these programs. Um, but the smaller niche staffing companies, you say, might need a little bit of time to get oriented to this. And But will they also see value in, in these solutions that are uh, more focused on the small and medium business, Jess? Yeah, I think that the, the value is still there, um, but we are definitely spending more time um, mm -hmm. with that particular um, group of, of suppliers, if you can kind of bucket them. Um, I would take it back to early MSP days in, you know, 2002, 2003. Um, we spent a lot of time um, in those implementations with suppliers of all shapes and sizes at that point because it wasn't necessarily a model um, that was um, widely adopted yet. It was a, it was a newer concept, um, and we needed to, to, to spend that time. You know, sometimes it was full sessions over the course of a day. And um, as the MSP uh, market has evolved, that conversation is, it's, I would never say it's not necessary, but it's a very small component because, you know, there are so many suppliers across the globe, quite frankly, that um, are used to playing in, in that space. But, you know, in the small and mid-market, we do run into some suppliers, again, it's a very small percentage, that may be hearing this for the first time or mm -hmm. involved in such a small set that um, they need a little bit more, you know, care and feeding, if you will. So it is the MSP's role or responsibility to educate, uh, to work with suppliers and essentially uh, retain all of the approved suppliers that a small, medium business might have. I think it's definitely the MSP's responsibility to ensure that adoption is high. I think it would be, um, you know, I, w I would be remiss, quite frankly, to um, imply that um, it's something that we 
we would say can be done really well alone. If it's a joint partnership yeah. with our clients, the adoption is Good better point. when um, the client is, is sitting side by side with, with that message. Sure. Kind of a unified front, you bet. Absolutely. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question on that too as well? Because one of the things I hear about is uh, the need the need for a stronger network. So when a, an organization like yours comes in, uh, are you seeing that more of your clients are asking for to help for your help to build a more robust delivery network? Absolutely. So I'm I'm seeing. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, and I would say again, you know, having been in all all shapes and sizes of MSP for you know the last 15 years, there's no question that um, the small and mid market, it feels a lot, and I say this um, quite frequently, it feels a lot like early enterprise and global MSP days, mm -hmm. um, and that includes um, coming to the table with suppliers that can potentially beef up what they're already doing. Um, are these small and mid sized Customers don't necessarily have the same access and visibility. Um, in, in, it might be a city by city um, approach or um, particular verticals. So there's no question that we're doing a little bit more from from a um, recommendation standpoint than we necessarily have needed to do on the on the global scale because they're already quite embedded in. Quite frankly, in those cases, we're usually optimizing versus adding. Hmm. Okay, good question, Richard. Thanks. Let's move to the next uh, question because I, I think this has commonly been a big concern of small business is when they saw the enterprise programs get rolled out, they heard about them in January and they didn't see any actual implementation and change of results until later on that year. And it might have taken six months, eight months to actually implement a large program. Um, I don't know how many mid-market companies have the kind of patience once they decide to, uh, to move forward, it's usually their nature to be fairly nimble and to move quickly on this. Uh, and Joanne, let me ask you from an impl implementation standpoint, how do you approach the mid-market any differently? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jay. Well, let me start out first by talking about the similarities that a mid-market organization should see in addition, in, in perspective from an implementation, regardless of their size of being a mid-market. Um, any MSP or VMS, when we're rolling out a program, the client should truly see that this is truly led by the MSP or the VMS partnership. There is a project management team. That team is responsible for lead, leading and guiding the process of the implementation, identifying to the client, again, regardless of size, these are the, um, the roles that we're going to need to meet with. These are the types of information that we're going to need to capture. We'll walk you through what that implementation is going to look like. We'll manage the entire project management piece, as well as defining what that project management time frame looks like. So that's one piece of what any organization, regardless of size, should expect. Other things would include such things as change management. This entire process of engaging with a VMS or an MSP is truly a change management in, in itself, right? You're going through something that may be not as centralized to something that is very centralized. Another thing, and I love, Jesse, that you referenced this in your earlier comments around the, the supply base. Regardless of size, your MSP and VMS will be reviewing your supply base because in order for an MSP to be successful, it's relying on that supply base. So an expectation of any type of client should be that a review of the supply base is included in an implementation. So that just gives you some commonalities in terms of what any organization, regardless of size, should see as part of implementation. Now, where there are opportunities where we can streamline and be able to accomplish a shorter time frame, Jay, as you mentioned, right, maybe there's a lack of tolerance of a longer time frame, is an opportunity for the MSP and VMS to provide some standardization. And some standardizations could include adopting a VMS or MSP's standardized jobs adopting standard integration, because Richard, I heard you say that earlier on, that there's opportunity for standard integration. In addition mm -hmm. to that, there's opportunities, yeah, there's opportunities that the technology firms, the VMS firms have now have um, a solution that will allow for a quote unquote quicker type of, of configuration effort. So that will allow some of the mid market to be able to adopt some things that an MSP can bring to the table because of the standardization that is offered for smaller type of programs. Um, but, you know, the title of this is One Size Does Not Fit All. I would be remiss by saying that 
any mid-market program should look like any other mid-market program, and that's certainly not the case, because there's still the evaluation to determine what makes the most sense for a client through the proper due diligence of, of implementation. Well, let me ask you another question just because it came up from the audience regarding the, the same kind of uh, idea in, in an implementation. Do they select sure. the traditional vendor neutral versus uh, maybe a primary supplier program in these mid-markets, or does it really matter? Yeah, that's a great question, and, and Jesse, feel free to add commentary here. There's different flavors of MSP solutions for mid-market. And even across the enterprise type of solution, there could be a combination of what an MSP solution could look like. Um, it could be in one area, perhaps it is a vendor neutral program. It could be maybe in another area that where there is a primary vendor. One of, um, one of the most common areas that we see where there is a primary vendor happens to be, of course, in light industrial, but there is other areas such as administrative or, or finance or those niche types of area where we can see a primary vendor prov providing the majority of the labor, and in another area, perhaps it is a, a, a vendor neutral type of model. Got it. Right. I couldn't agree more, um, Joanne. I think you hit it um, on the head. And, and the, the one thing that I would add to it is um, I believe that vendor neutrality is starting to become less of a, you know, that, that was the huge um, focus for um, our customer base, um, Enterprise Global, for years. And, um, and, and it's certainly still a part of the conversation, but I think and having spent a lot of time over in Europe where it's it's far less of a, of a driver, um, I think we're starting to see that shift a little bit, and certainly the small and mid-market are, I think, more open um, today than our enterprise customers were 10 years ago to um, being more prescriptive um, and deliberate about their supply-based management strategy, which because of what Joanne mentioned, we're talking about some of the light industrial clients, those with high volume, clerical, um, you know, what have you, um, usually the strategy does lend itself to certainly a smaller, more refined supply base, and in some cases, a master vendor or a vendor on-premise type mm -hmm. arrangement. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the opportunity to leverage a supplier in a mid-market type of solution, the value, of course, to to the client to ensure that they have the right quality, the right, um, you know, cost, et cetera, is just significant. All right, well, let's talk about that because I think the service and the capabilities that are typically aligned with the the large enterprise uh, clients uh, could be different. Are there sacrifices in service and capabilities based on maybe the, some of the streamlined nature or uh, you know some of the the focus that the uh, that the MSP uh, add to this relationship? Jess, why don't you continue on then? Sure, thanks, Jay. I think sacrifice is a bit of a strong word, um, but as Joanne mentioned, this session is titled "One Size Does Not Fit All." and it's important for providers and clients to recognize that there will be differences. However, differences should not translate into less than. Um, we hear a lot of different terminology in the marketplace when a service is transformed to meet the needs of smaller businesses, but I think it's important to avoid words like skinny or light when describing MSP for the small to mid-sized market. I sometimes hear our enterprise and global programs using the phrase full service on that side, and that implies services targeted toward the mid-market don't enjoy the same benefits, including candidate quality, strong technology, streamlined processes, insightful analytics, the list goes on. I'm quite maniacal um, about changing the conversation around this topic. An MSP program should bring with it unparalleled service, and that doesn't change based on size. The same applies to results. Our clients regardless of size, set a, a high bar, and they expect us to meet and exceed it. Of course, there are some differences. As I mentioned, we're usually talking to small and mid-sized clients who need to get their MSP programs up and running quickly. So you'll see a smaller set of integrations traditionally, which allow us to stand a program up quicker um, in less than half the time, actually. And the technology mm -hmm. configurations are less complex. And there's also a, small, a smaller supplier population, as we've, we've spent some time on already um, today. So all of these factors contribute to a simpler product, but not a less impactful one. Great. So I mean, clearly what you're saying then is that the services don't d diminish. It, it really is because of the size and scale of the client's requirements. That's really where the diminishing 
uh, effort or, or time or uh, other uh, restraints are placed, but uh, from a service and capability standpoint, then market companies should really see uh, see an equal uh, share of, of benefit. You got it. Yeah. Can I can I add to that just a little bit from a technology sure. side? You know, you are spot on on that. The services really do need to be uh, as as robust for any client. If you take on the responsibility of taking on the client's business, you want to service the heck out of it. So that was well said. On the technology side, one of the limitations I spoke of earlier becomes an asset sometimes when you've got um, you know, a leaner organization or a smaller organization or a smaller channel for approvals. But even with uh, the technology, you can move very, very swiftly, as you said, and, and sometimes half the time, uh, even, even less in some cases. Uh, you know, with an open architecture and, and the modern technologies now, doing some of those integrations are, are off-the-shelf APIs um, and, and can be done. So I, I echo what Jesse said. There's, there's, there shouldn't be any sacrifices. It just becomes a matter of priorities and how fast you can move to, to align the resources. So that was well said. Um, Jesse, thank you for that. So let me uh, keep you on the line then, Richard. Uh, it, it sounds as though... Um, there's a lot of benefit that could be uh, received just as the enterprise has received uh, if you're a mid-market company. But I wonder uh, how does a company recognize when they're ready? And, and maybe uh, I'll combine that with an audience question which says, all right, you guys have sold me. This sounds really interesting. What if I'm unhappy with the provider I have? How easy is it to, is it to change out? So if you could kind of answer those two questions for me, Richard. Well, how easy is it to change out the provider? Well, it depends on if you're the provider or the new provider, um, <laughs> I suspect. Um, it's it's really, you know, it, it's not that difficult because data resides in databases and it's digital and forming can be transferred. Services and, and workflows, I mean, that's really what you want. Uh, that becomes part of your your um, your workflow and your transition. So they're not as difficult. As a matter of fact, you've already, if you've got a supplier and you and you know depending on what the the issue is, um, it may be very simple. Uh, but mm -hmm. if it's if your if your difficulty is at the core of of the workflows, then you might have to start over with developing your workflows. But you know you know you're ready when you know you've got a problem with your workforce, and those problems can be several things. One is, is you've set a strategy to use a flexible workforce. You know, that's a really a good time to start thinking about it. Now, whether size and scale and spend uh, is there to sustain um, any kind of program, you know, there are, there are organizations like the ones that are represented today that can handle things at some fairly low, low levels and then scale you into a, a fuller solution as you grow. So, you know, there's a vendor on premise, you know, can grow into a full blown vendor neutral MSP global, uh, you know, there's technologies that can handle rec to check. And then all of a sudden you're building communities and um, uh, talent pools and automations and integrations, uh, you know, such as ours uh, that will scale with you without having to go out and rebuy or reinstall. So those are some good things. So, you know, you know, you're ready when you're starting to use flexible labor as a, as a strategy for your business. You know, you're, you're looking at, you know, a three to $5 million spend um, is, is a good, good time to start thinking about how can I optimize that spend and get the most out of it. I mean, that's the thresholds that we're seeing now that are coming down. Now, in some cases that has to be 10 million, 20 million, depending on the mix and the workflows you've got. And the uh, and, and again, everybody's got to make it a business case as well. So when you start yeah. to see, go ahead. I, I've got a couple more here that if no, you go ahead, to Richard. Variate, what's that? Go ahead and finish. Oh, okay. You know, when you're seeing a, a large variation in your cost, so you're paying different rates for the same resource, or you're you know different markups for the same resource, you start to see some variation. That's a really good sign. You, you know, you start to consider um, a total talent management model where you know you're recruiting. And you're wanting, you know, you recruit three people for a position, um, and you hire one. There's two there that you don't know what to do with, and how do you hang on to that talent? You know, are, there there are multiple sources of, of, of retaining that talent, and when you start to look at uh, independent contractors and freelancers, 
that's those are those are good signals that you might be ready for a workforce program. Uh, again, it, it, when you start to see that it, uh, your talent acquisition is a hindrance for your growth, good time to start looking. And then you know uh, one of the key ones that I always, you know, well I'm happy the way I'm 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 happy with the way we're running business. And the question I always like to ask is, how do you know you're happy? The data alone that you get from a workforce program can help you make some really great decisions um, and help you with some compliance and with co-employment and with uh, rates and, you know, with all of the artificial intelligence and the automation and, the, and, the, and just the data collection and presentation, you should be able to make some very good business decisions. So if you're wondering, you know, how do I know I'm happy, you know, that, that's a really good way to start. You know, I wanted to add one thing to uh, to what you said, Richard. When Please. I consult, when I consult with companies, quite often the first thing I ask them is, how much are you spending, and in what categories are you spending um, your your contingent workforce uh, dollars? in? if you can't answer the question, that's it's probably a good point. time to start thinking about whether or not you need to implement a solution. When the CEO says. Gee, I see this. Uh, this is a huge spend category uh, that we have for staffing. Uh, what's that made up of? And if you can't give them definitive answers and give them a nice report that summarizes how long those people have been here and what they do and and why you're going contingent versus full time, that's another good rationale for for bringing a program, a BMS and MSP, uh, to to kind of take that and, and make it more transparent, make it more analytical. Um, so that that uh, I think would be a compliment to your answers. Anybody else want to throw in another how you know you're ready? All right, I'm going to move there to is, the next. Well, well, there well there is one more that one more. You know, it, 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 it's kind of topical. It's when you ask how do you know who's in your building? Yeah, from a security standpoint, yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and this this is where I think, and, and maybe we'll get this into the. Uh, into this next question, the, the, the categories of workers that you generally find moving into uh, to a workforce management program, what are those most commonly uh, targeted for your first uh, implementation? And, and I know they could go into uh, freelancers, consultants, SOW, uh, we could go all over the place, but where do you start? And I think that's a, that's a, a good question that we could ask, and maybe I'll, I'll Ask Joanne to answer that. Yeah, certainly. And, and this question could actually, actually be answered in many different ways, as you pointed out, Jay. Is it categorization in terms of contingent, statement of work, um, freelancers, et cetera? Or you could also be asking a similar question in terms of whether or not it's a type of in industry of worker, right? Whether it's an IT or LI, et cetera. So there's a couple different ways that you could look at this question. Um, and, you know, the broader question is, you know, should we, should we be looking at a quote unquote big bang, <laughs> right? Implementation, or should we be looking at a phasing approach, which, which for each organization, the answer may very well, well differ, right? If you are uh, proof of concept type of organization, then certainly, of course, you may want to look at the phasing type of approach. Um, if you are one that not so much in terms of needing a proof of concept, you feel as though your urgency around the value that these programs bring is immediate, then certainly working with your MSP and VMS for a Big Bang Theory may very well work for you as well. Um, well, when we talk about the contingent, the categories of labor, if we focus on whether it's um, uh, contingent, SOW, and I use the, the, the contingent broadly, um, as we all know, these types of industries stemmed from those that were considered staff augmentation, right? And then now we lead into the SOW, and even now we're even going into, into the quote-unquote freelancers. The bigger question here for any organization is what what is the objective or what are the objectives of your program? Is it risk? Is it visibility? What are those objectives? And then collaboratively, your, your MSP and BMS will consult around which should go first. If it's such things as we are at risk because we, have, we allow for 1099s and we are unfamiliar with how we are managing them or vetting them, then a recommendation could be you should be including your 1099 in addition to your quote unquote staff augmentation type of workers. So is there an easy answer? Perhaps. 
Um, however, it should be specific to an organization around what objectives they're trying to solve. Um, and at the same time, historically, it has been staff all goes first, SOWs, freelancers, et cetera, but that conversation will be critical with any organization to have with their MSP and VMS provider. Now, let, me, let me ask for maybe a clarification question, too, on this section. I got, I got a question from the audience really asking about services procurement, which is really your SOW, mm -hmm. your uh, uh, non-employee, or meaning they're not employed by a staffing agency. Um, right. Are those workers typically included in, in, a, in a Gen 1 or first uh, workforce management program for a small to mid company? We're starting to see this more and more in Gen 2. However, at the same time, if you are now only engaging in the opportunity to have a program for a generation one, we are having those conversations around inclusion of services procurement in the, in the program because of the full transparency and visibility as well as reducing risk that the program will allow for. I was actually on, a, on an earlier um, uh, industry event and one of the studies where 2015, the response on ish, interest of SOW in their programs were in the low 20s. The results in 2016 were in the high 40s. So there's mm -hmm. recognition of the value that having services procurement in these programs uh, brings to any organization. Great, thanks for that question uh, and that answer. Let's, uh, m let's move to another uh, question because this to me is where I think a lot of small and medium-sized businesses aspire. They, they expect that they're not always gonna be a mid-market uh, company. Their, their, uh, their channel for growth is strong. They wanna uh, utilize this nimble workforce to, to be more competitive. Let's say they've achieved that and they have grown and maybe now they're more like an enterprise or maybe they've got more global demands or maybe as we mentioned earlier, more services procurement or outsourced work that they want to include in their programs. Um, as the mid-market client grows, what changes or opportunities do they have relative to their workforce management solutions? And let me throw that back to Jesse. Thanks, Jay. Um, you know, much like the conversation we've had thus far, the mid-market is engaging in similar conversations about the evolution of their program and strategic roadmap, just as our enterprise and global clients do, and Joanne hit on a lot of this um, in that previous question. The mid-market MSP is typically launched with a traditional contingent workforce scope, um, again, as Joanne mentioned, but our conversations are quickly evolving with this customer base to include freelancers, FTE, services procurement for sure, and global scope as well is entering the conversation. And as Richard mentioned earlier, these mid-market programs can certainly evolve through organic growth, expansions, and acquisitions into the size and scope of an enterprise or global client. And this could include additional implementation efforts. That, in, that includes some of the things I spoke about earlier that may not be a part of the original mid-market program launch, such as complex integrations, um, the introduction of a larger supply base, customized configuration to accommodate specific worker categories, pricing, or countries. So certainly, and I think there's a theme here, um, you know, about, you know, sometimes different um, really is more uh, the same than um, we necessarily give it credit for. And um, what a, a smaller mid-market mid size business wants to do with its contingent workforce program is no different. Um, as, we, as we discussed earlier, they want the same benefits, the same results, um, you know, visibility, compliance, cost, all of those things. Um, and that can certainly be applied to um, some of the broader services and products that come along with um, bringing an MSP and VMS solution to the table. Jesse, can I add, just add to that? Because you hit on something that I think is really, really important, and that's the integration of an acquisition. There's a lot of acquisition going on in the mid-market area, and when there's a workforce strategy in place and in some kind of program or a process, that integration between the two companies is a great way to start and a great place to to begin integrating those companies because when you've got established workflows that can transfer uh, and then you can scale your program, that's a really ideal way to start uh, start that integration. And I know that HR folks uh, struggle with that integration aspect, and this is a really, really uh, highly desirable attribute. Agreed. All right, so we have a lot of information that we've exchanged here, and some of these companies are, um, uh, you know, maybe 
in our audience are maybe getting a little bit more inquisitive about where do I get uh, good solution, expertise, resources, best practices, uh, because I, I want to start considering this as a, as a solution for my organization. Joanne, what, how would you direct them to find best practices and, and, and resources? Yeah, certainly I'll start, and of course the rest of the panel can provide some additional context here as well, but certainly, of course, anyone in the panel, as you can tell, can provide some level of, of information beyond, of course, this webinar. Um, SIG alone, I would, I would, of course, say that this is an excellent source, a resource for you to understand what options there are available and how to find these best practices for the mid-market type of workforce solution. Uh, in addition to that, there are several types of analysts that are out there that provide various different um, best practices, survey results, et cetera. Um, the likes of, of course, Everest, for example. So there have been many opportunities for anyone who is interested in ex uh, evaluating this further to, to have access to. Any other panelists want to? throw some best practice resources out there? I think, well, uh, you, you know, you go, you go to the company websites of any of these companies that are represented today and you go out to their knowledge centers or their, their case studies, there, there's some really good information out there. Good. Uh, just on the company websites on, on how to get started, what to get started, what to look for, and, and, and any number of topics. I'll also Absolutely. Leave it. My phone number will be at the, the end of this uh, presentation, so that's a good place to start as well. Um, yes. But no selling in this uh, particular conference. Webinar. Absolutely. Uh, let me throw another question that I've seen from the audience that might be uh, relevant, and, and that is that, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a, a point in which you decide, uh, but where do you really start? Is it start by internally selling the organization, getting an executive sponsor? Uh, you know, you're listening to this and you're you're kind of saying, yeah, we need to do something here. We've got so many workers that we don't have good transparency and we know that this would be a benefit. How do you get started? Let me throw that to Richard. Oh, thank you, because I'm just chomping at the bit to jump on that. I'm a big fan of John Cotter's leading change. He's got eight steps of change, and his first one is create a sense of urgency. That first step is understanding that there's there's some urgency there. Is it for the financial gain? Is it for the, the process controls? Is it for the risk mitigation? You just got to create that sense of urgency and then get, you know, find that guiding coalition, get that group of people together that are committed to it. That's how you get started. Now, mm -hmm. the rest of it becomes, you know, how do you select your vendors and how do you, you know, you go through those steps. But uh, without that foundational uh, vision, if, if you will, and, and priorities, which some of the, you know, some of us can help you get to those as part of the process. Uh, you've got to have that buy-in, and you've got to be committed to it. Um, that way, that way, it works out very, very well for you, and it hits what you want your program to accomplish. So th th that's a great place to start, from my perspective. Anyone else? Yeah, I would echo. This is Jesse. I would echo um, Richard's sentiments for sure. I think if I'm, I'm just kind of reflecting on um, the conversations I've had with the customers in this um, market for the, you know, over the past eight months or so. Um, and I think I'm, I'm seeing kind of two, um, two interesting, um, you know, facets of, of the conversation. One is more than any other um, experience that I've had with customers that are looking to engage um, a more sophisticated solution for their contingent workforce. In the mid-market space, we're seeing a much um, more joined-up approach between HR and procurement, um, which in my opinion is a very positive thing. I think you can lead change um, much faster, um, adoption is um, easier, and, um, and, and we can really demonstrate and, and have conversations about results that impact all facets of the organization rather than it being just a cost play for, for procurement or, um, you know, compliance or, or you know, time to fill in, in some of those, you know, kind of SLA type metrics um, for HR. Um, but on the other hand, um, and probably the bigger challenge compared to the work we do on the enterprise and global side is um, there is typically less resource. So although there, there's a higher level of engagement and I'm seeing more interaction from the, 
presidential level, the C-suite, um, um, more than, you know, your, your traditional kind of procurement management level, um, sometimes it's a lack of resource. So there is, I think that speaks more directly to what Richard is talking about, um, making a case for change um, and certainly getting in, in front of decision makers, I think is in, extremely important. I spend probably more than 50% of my time um, educating customers. And that's mm -hmm. a conversation that I love to have the, uh, the teams across all organizations in this space. And I think Joanne would, would echo that sentiment um, to the extent that you've, you've got a, um, a case, but you're not sure what to do with it. Engaging com companies like ours um, is a really good place to start because it's not about, it's not a sales conversation. It's, um, it's very much about educating, um, giving you some, some material, arming you with, with um, some of those things that, that will resonate with um, each of the groups within your organization. Yeah, Jesse, I couldn't agree with you more. And just what's happening in the marketplace, mm -hmm. Jay, you referenced earlier when we first started how the contingent workers in terms of the percentage of what makes up the workforce is increasing, right? So just having some of those, that example of, of what's happening in the market can assist in building that business case, building that value proposition. You know, I'll add one thing that, uh, that I've noticed in, in this medium-sized market is that a lot of these companies don't really even have a procurement director. It's like a finance person that takes care of accounting and, 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 and procurement as well as other things. Um, but HR uh, generally, or even personnel, if it's that small a company, will all step up and say, yeah, we have to take responsibility for any human resources in the company. So as you guys have just mentioned, that concert of both uh, you know, finance, procurement, et cetera, uh, along with the HR or talent part of the organization, critical in these, these small, medium uh, businesses to kind of come together, uh, build a business case, and then go out uh, and, and, and seek the, the solutions expertise from these providers. Um, we're in the Q&A portion. I do have one question, kind of an interesting question. I'll, I'll pose it uh, in, in general to our, um, to our uh, panelists here. So uh, Mike says, uh, my experience with big box staffing providers is poor. I, I think he's talking about the Walmart. No, maybe not. Um, anyway, he says that the experience is poor, uh, but oh, I'm, I'm just lost the question. Hold on. Okay, somehow I lost the question. Uh, but here it is. The can an MSP program with an MSP provider as part of that big box staffing uh, conglomerate uh, really be vendor neutral uh, in kind of uh, a large program for a small business? And I'll, I'll throw that out to, uh, uh, to Joanne to start with being part of that big box, I guess, as you would refer to it. Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to make some assumptions on what the big box means, but um, <laughs> I, I'm sure both Jesse and I can talk about, you know, in our respective organizations, the fact that we do have vendor neutral programs. We have programs that our own staffing affiliates do not provide resource into. Um, however, the key when you're looking at vendor neutrality for an organization, for a client, is the visibility that that allows for a client to see how these programs are being managed to ensure that it is truly vendor neutral, right? The, the supplier scorecarding results, um, the supplier management, the visibility that a VMS alone can provide in terms of, you know, when certain um, client or suppliers, excuse me, are receiving these types of, of uh, requisitions, what types of trends we're seeing that are truly auditable in, in the VMS. So can there be? Absolutely. Um, as Jesse stated earlier, though, there is some trending that we see, even in the mid-market as well as enterprise, where the vendor neutral, neutral programs are not the only op options right now that are being discussed. The primary supplier, the direct type of sourcing, are also some some uh, of those conversations that we're having in the in the marketplace. And the idea can of I, selecting I, your own providers, I, I guess, as a as a small mid market company, um, if you go to one of these big box uh, providers, uh, you might be bringing very small niche companies into the mix. Is that an acceptable <laughs> solution? 
It absolutely is an acceptable. Oh, sorry. Yep. Jay, no, good. this is Jesse. Um, no, go ahead. It, is, it is absolutely an acceptable solution. I think that, you know, the one, the one challenge with vendor neutrality in any program, and anybody from any company running it would tell you, the focus has to be quality of talent. And where yeah. we start to, to get a little bit, um, we deviate from that as if we're so focused, to, so focused on vendor neutrality, we may be eliminating um, the best in the business for a specific market or skill set, um, you know, or, or location. So I think that's probably um, the, the one thing that we, we need to keep in mind. And, and I'm very pleased to see the conversations across all clients, no matter the shape or size, in today's um, environment is that quality is starting to lead again. Um, and, you know, it, there's always, depending on what's happening, you know, just across the world, certainly there are going to be cost pressures in, in one year and, um, you know, all the little nuances like that. But quality should be leading the conversation um, without question. Good answer. Yeah. And just, yeah, and just, I would imagine that that's, that's a leading trend as to why we're having the conversations around the opportunity for some direct fulfillment or some master vendor type of solutions within a broader MSP program, right, because of the focus on quality. You got it. Absolutely. Can I take a little bit different answer to that? Yeah, go ahead, Rich. Uh, it, it, the data. You know, what's the data telling you? Is it the, is it the fact that you've got a big box person not following your process, or do you have – an outstanding supplier following a process that may not be be doing what you need it to do. Just like when I say, how do you know you're happy? How do you know when you're unhappy? And I would recommend a, a, a just a real quick five wise exercise to get down to before you start changing your model and your 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 um, your your model and your suppliers. Take a look at what really is causing the the um, the difficulties. So that's where I know a lot of the again. A lot of the key providers uh, and, and, the, and the VMS providers like ourselves who, who uh, really let the data drill down into it, uh, that, that's where some resolution uh, becomes very, very powerful rather than switching, switching providers only to find out that you still have the same problem later. Let me try to sneak in one more question from the audience. Will a mid-market program see an on-site MSP program team versus a remote, remotely managed uh, program in order to manage the overhead more effectively. I guess that's one of those sacrifice questions. Uh, are they going to sacrifice an on-site person and and really have more of a remote access? Uh, let me let me throw that to Jesse. Thanks, Jay. Um, and it's a great question. Um, the the answer, based on my own experience over the past year, is that it is it's depending on um, on every client conversation. Um, I will tell you that I believe, and I see this shifting in enterprise and global as well, um, less of a reliance on an on-site program um, team um, just because of the way the world of work is changing. And certainly um, we've got, you know, a number of examples of on-site teams that really sit on site but spend the majority of their time interacting via email and instant messaging channels and things like that. Um, so certainly in the mid-market, um, you know, what, I'd like, what I'm definitely um, encouraging our current and future clients to consider is um, if they're asking for an on-site team, what is driving that request? Um, you know, what is the why behind it? And, and sometimes, mm -hmm. and most often, it's, it's about comfort level versus an actual business need. Um, but I have examples where our mid-market clients have on-site teams. So it isn't something that um, is, a, is an easy yes or no question. Um, we've got to talk about what's driving it, um, what we're solving by it, you know, how many locations are there, how many people are we actually going to be interacting with. So um, it's definitely an interesting part of our conversation today, and I believe that um, it will continue to evolve as we're creating proof points um, throughout this, this mid-market space. Um, the, the mantra I use is we, we reserve the right to change, and, um, and we're not taking um, a stance one way or another in any of our MSP programs, regardless of the size, at this point. Great. Well, good summary. I, and let me let me kind of see. I, I have about hey, thirty seconds. Go ahead. You want to take hey, Jay, that? Actually, Pat? Jay, actually, um, you know, we're, we will have to close the session because we're going to have to okay. stop on time. Um, well, thanks everybody. Oh, I'll turn it back to Snake. Yeah, appreciate it, guys. Thank you, Jay, Richard, uh, Joanne, and Jesse um, for sharing your insights with us today.
um, I, I thought the format was spectacular, and, and I think, you know, we should, we should plan on uh, doing this again, um, and we look forward to connecting with you guys soon. Uh, folks, we're going to push out the slide deck uh, from today's presentation out to you now, so you should see that coming your way shortly. Um, and then just, again, want to thank all the participants today uh, and to those who asked questions. Uh, we'll see you all back here on the SIG webinar series again, uh, June 27th, for our next webinar with Zykus discussing the postal procurement in 2017. Okay, so thanks again, Jay, Richard, Joanne, and Jesse, and I hope all of you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.